Um, oh, recording is in progress in my hair, head. Okay, great. Um, we are all gathered here today. We're so delighted to have people um, virtually for this live Zoom event. Uh, transitioning to newer normals, which I love that word normal in there because what's normal these days? How kids books and authors can help. And as educators, parents, artists, authors, we all know that kids books are super powerful. So it'll be very exciting to hear our panelists today share their ideas and inspiration for how we can use kids books in these times. Um, uh, just my name is Sonia Tedder Moore, and I am one of the children's booksellers at Warwick's Books. And I think probably everyone knows what Warwick's is, but just in case anyone has joined on and is saying, "What's Warwick's?" It is an independent bookstore in the heart of La Jolla Village in San Diego, and it is has the honor of being the longest contiguously family-owned business in the country, or bookstore business in the country celebrating its 125th anniversary this year. So that's pretty exciting, yay, claps. And today we are hosting this wonderful event with our fabulous panelists. And I am so excited because actually you're all from the uh, Southern California area. So it's lovely to have that much talent and creativity close by. Um, let's see, how are we doing on the numbers? Oh, we're doing great. I'll just cover a couple of other housekeeping things as we wait for the last folks. Um, and just introduce our fantastic panelists. And in no particular order, I'll start with Chris Barron over here, who is a professor of English at San Diego City College and the author of the novels, All of Me and his most recent novel, The Magical Imperfect. He also has published a adult poetry collection as part of the poetry anthology Under the Broom Tree, which is a winner of the San Diego Book Award. And he lives right here in San Diego with his wife and three children, three gold stars. And we're delighted to have you, Chris. We also have over here Matt de la Pena, uh, the Newbery Medal winning author of Last Stop on Market Street. He is also the author of the award winning picture books Milo Imagines the World. Carmela Full of Wishes, Love, and A Nation's Hope, the story of boxing legend Joe Lewis. And also he has written young adult novels, seven critically acclaimed ones, including A Mexican White Boy. And he teaches creative writing and visits schools and colleges and elementary schools all around the country, including my daughters. So very excited. And we are delighted to have you, Matt. And you have two children. Yeah. Yep, so. two kids. Two kids, so Big great. Big Warwick's fans. Right, oh yes. <laughs> so we have authors and parents. Um, also we have today um, our moderator who is going to be Dr. Virginia Lohagen, who is an author, a, a former K through eight teacher, a university professor and current director of the Asian Pacific Islander Desi American Center at San Diego State University. And she is so prolific in her writing that if I started listing them all, we'd be here for a very long time. She likes to write books about things that geek her, it says in her bio. And I love that because that probably means a lot of things, Virginia. She likes to write about her Chinese American heritage and fun facts about anything on the odd side. And uh, we have a bunch of your books in my family. So it's a delight to have you and thank you for moderating today, Virginia. And uh, we also have, I think on the bottom of your screen, maybe as well as mine, there's Sally J. Pla, who is the author of two acclaimed novels, The Someday Birds and Stanley Will Probably Be Fine, and the beautiful picture book, Benji, The Bad Day and Me. She has English degrees from the colleges of Penn State and Colgate and has worked as a business journalist and in public education and lives with her family in an undisclosed location near lots of lemon trees in Southern California. North of North us? County, North County. North County, okay, there we go. All right, <laughs> delighted to see you. And then right in the center of my screen, I don't know about yours, is Min Lee, who is an author and national early childhood policy expert. He uh, wrote the graphic novel, Green Lantern Legacy, the picture books Lift and Drawn Together were, that were illustrated by his friend Dan Santat, and also the picture books Let Me Finish and The Perfect Self. 
He has also written for The New Yorker, The Huffington Post, The Horn Book. I mean, what else have you written for? Probably tons of things, Ben. And he currently lives here in San Diego with his wife and two kids. So two more gold stars. Wow. Thanks for joining us today. So we have this really wonderful um, panel of creative and um, very educated people, and they're gonna share their ideas with you. So just two things, if you're interested in any of their books, which I'm sure you all are, just remember you can go to the Warwick's website, right where this events page is, there's a green button that click here, and it'll have all their books on there. You just click, 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 easy as pie. The other thing is, is if you look down on the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A all the way on the right on the toolbar there at the bottom. You can click on that today um, to submit a question to our panel. So without further ado, Virginia, let's get the conversation going and I'm going to mute myself so I can just listen and enjoy. Great. Thank you so much, Sonia. And a big thank you to Warwick's for hosting us. And I like the, um, you know, Sonia's little click, 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 because that is definitely what we need to do. We need to click, 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 keep us in business, keep us writing, um, and support Warwick's as well, our independent bookseller. Um, and a big thanks to Chris Barron for putting us, getting us together. We have so many... <laughs> schedules and, and competing things, but Chris said, we're going to do this. So we did it. Um, so thank you so much for organizing us as well. Um, and yeah, this is really exciting. So we're all San Diegan authors. We're all, um, you know, kidlit folks, and we're all here today. And we do have um, a set of questions that we're going to be talking about, but please know too that we really want to hear from y'all. Um, and we want to address the questions that you have, etc. So we will be leaving time at the end, but go ahead and write your questions in the Q&A um, as we're talking or after we're talking or whenever it strikes you um, and we'll get to it. But we're really excited to be in conversation with y'all. We're just hoping to have some fun today. Um, okay, so the first question that I have is how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect the meanings of our books and our writing? And we had talked about how, you know, books change over time as you read them and each time you read them because we change. And so what did, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect us and how did it affect our, um, the meanings of our books and what the books meant to us as well? And I know teachers out there, one of the big lessons that y'all do is always, what's the author's message here? Um, and, <laughs> you know, and I think we spend a lot of time interpreting that, but sometimes, you know, it's like it's different from what actually the author wanted. So we're, I just, we kind of want to dig deep into those type of, um, um, question. So we'll start with Min. Min, what about you? So how did COVID affect um, the meanings of your book and your writing and or your writing? Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for kicking us off. Um, it's a, I mean, all of you know, it's a weird thing to be a writer because it takes at least two years from the time you're writing a book to when it's on the shelf. So it's like this weird time travel element of like, we're writing to an audience in the future and we have no idea what the context or what the world's going to look like then, right? Um, so I wrote... The, the best example is probably I wrote Lyft um, well before I ever heard of COVID or pandemic or quarantine or anything like that. Um, and the book came out right in the middle of the pandemic. And it became an interesting situation where the book took on a new meaning and a new relevance for, for kids and parents and teachers um, because I get all these really kind messages from people saying, you know, we are locked down right now. We can't get out of our apartment. We can't get out of our house but we've been using your book to kind of like use our imaginations to, to travel. Um, and I love the fact that a book like this plays into the idea of um, the fact that you can always escape with, through the power of a good book, um, if, through the power of your imagination and, and all that. And so it's been really um, a surprise, but a, a wonderful one to see a book that was written in a completely different context um, take, on, take on meaning in that way. Um, so much so that when this first came out, Dan went out of his way and created this um, printable elevator button that you can print. And so we get pictures of kids with putting elevator buttons up next to their closet and like going on, pretending to go on different adventures. So um, any when times are as dire as they are, as they have been, um, any kind of feeling that you're making a difference to, in families' lives is, is really meaningful. So I've been really um, grateful for, for being able to be with people during a pandemic in this, in this particular way. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. We'll go to Sally. What about you, Sally? How did um, COVID-19, the pandemic, affect you in your writing? Well, it's kind of interesting, I guess, because all of my books deal with anxiety <laughs> and fear, overcoming fear and anxiety and, and mental health, really. Uh, you know, they all have characters in them. The main characters are contending with that or pushing against their own fear. They have brains that work a little bit differently because I'm autistic and that's really a big part of why I write and the kind of characters I want to bring um, to literature. But um, that whole thing about pushing past your fear or a scary world out there is the basis really of my two middle grade novels. So. I think that <laughs> it's a pretty universal um, theme these days. So for, you know, for many reasons. And when I, you know, when I talk to kids, you know, it, it is a great entry point to just talk about their own fears too. Like in, you know, the virtual visits this past year, kids have really shared their stories, you know, just on a more emotional level about that, you know, and about scenes like there's a, there's a scene in one of my books where the main character, Charlie, is um, super scared of going down this big water slide. And he's like, shaking and you know, really, really afraid. But then he goes down it and he does get injured. But he says, you know, it was the scariest part was just the anticipation you know, of, of worrying about the thing and not the thing itself. Right. And we talk about that a lot, you know, about anxiety and how it may make us grow outsized fears and how do we manage that. Yeah. So it's been nice to have that um, entree into those kinds of conversations with kids in classrooms about the books. Because it doesn't really matter what triggers the fear, but we're all deal dealing with those feelings uh, a little bit now. So, and I think you bring up several, you know, reasons why books are so important. One, because if they do give us various entry points, and also that they also like create these universal feelings that like we're in it together. And that was a big mantra, you know, with the pandemic, like we're doing this together, we're in this together. Um, and, you know, I think that that it's nice to know that other people are also facing these struggles and these anxieties. And they, you know, and you also brought up this issue of, uh, of uncertainty. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned from the pandemic is that I'm better at dealing with uncertainty. <laughs> you know, I've learned to be more comfortable with ambigu ambiguity, whereas before it's like, I wanted a structure, I like organization, I like things like that. We just have yeah. to learn that it's okay to be uncertain, you know, and that's hard. That's really hard. And before we move on to um, Chris, I'm going to have you respond next. But before I move to Chris, I want to give Sally, um, uh, well, let's talk a second about your, you know, talking about anxiety and your, um, you, your website, A Novel Mind. Thank you. Um, yes. If you could just plug that for a second, and this is a great resource for all you teachers out there. Yeah, I'm. All, I'm also admin and editor at a website called anovelmind.com. Just a novelmind.com, um, and it's a resource for uh, mental health and neurodiversity representation in children's literature. We have this huge searchable database of more than a thousand books where you can just enter in if you're looking for a book on eating disorders for YA or a book on anxiety for preschoolers. I mean, you can enter it all in and you, you can search. And we also have weekly blog posts um, by guest writers and um, all kinds of educator resource pages now. So yeah, give it a look. I, I, you know, it's just a labor of love that, you know, me and a couple of friends put together, <laughs> but yeah. it's really, really grown. And we have some amazing uh, guest writers coming up this year. So really excited about it. Yeah, it's an amazing resource. And I we also know, um, having done a lot of events with teachers, how teachers like to walk away with some takeaways. So we're letting you all know this is a takeaway. So novelmind.com, I put it in the um, the chat. So you're welcome, y'all. You okay, Chris, go. What is, so how's yeah. COVID affected you? Yeah, I mean, so many things. And I, I agree with Min and Sally. I mean, just what you're saying that, you know, the process of writing books takes such a period of time that, you know, it's interesting to see where our books land um, for me, Magical and Perfect in particular is all about community. And I feel like this COVID time has really shifted my thinking of community to even want it more. Um, I've always believed in it, even though I'm kind of introverted, quiet, I, I, I long for community and, and true community. I think that's actually part of, to plug it, why I'm glad we're meeting today to, to be here as authors in San Diego, to connect with hopefully other teachers to know we're here, we're part of a community. 
And it's really crystallized that for me as a strength of survival and success for us, for our families as citizens, like connecting with one another and being there for one another. Um, but on a very practical level, I didn't expect that, the, and in a good way, the way that say readers have reacted, especially to like Magic and Perfect is a novel in verse, where they'll take a concept that's in the book like shyness and they'll write a poem in reaction. And it's suddenly a connecting point. And so I see those tethers of community forming and I'm like, yes, to more of that. Like, that's a way a connecting point in a place where we have to be separated more than we wanna be. Um, these things are helping us come through. Absolutely, thank you so much. And Matt, so what about you? I, and I think you're the one that drafted this question to begin with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I just, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, as, as writers, we're all, you know, we have other responsibilities, all of us, you know, we're parents, we're professors, whatever we are. I think the writing portion of my life became smaller over the pandemic because all of a sudden I was doing first grade math, which is really hard these days. And, um, you know, just supporting my kids' education. And, and that's very valuable to me. And at first I used, to, I used to beat myself up about that. And I thought, I used to judge my self-worth based solely on how much production I had as, as a writer during a given day. And I've had to adjust that. So that's a big thing that I wanted to mention. But teachers went through the same thing, right? Teachers of my kids, of Min's kids, of Chris's kids, Sally, I don't know how old your children are. Um, teachers have had to adjust on the fly too. And this is kind of a small off topic thing, but I remember my, my daughter was in kindergarten and she was on Zoom for 45 minutes a day. And it was really hard. And I feel like me and my wife were her main teacher, teachers, but her kindergarten teacher came by on her birthday and dropped off a little gift you know, on our doorstep in the middle of the height of the pandemic. And she got it and like that made her year. Yeah. So like these little gestures can be so powerful. And I think we can pull them into, you know, when this Delta thing calms down and <laughs> like returns to normal. And then just real quick, I'll briefly mention in our books, I have a theory that writers are often, or I mean, I'm sorry, readers are often smarter than writers. So we put a story down we believe that this is an interesting story worth reading, but readers come along and give it meaning. Mm -hmm. um, they find layers that we didn't even know were there. Uh, so that's an amazing thing in the regular time. But during the pandemic, I'll just show you one illustration. I don't know if you could see this, but this is an image from a book called Love, illustrated by Lauren Long. And when I wrote the text, I thought of DACA. And, you know, here's a... a Mexican-American family who's worried that some family members won't be able to stay here. The uh, illustrator, Lauren Long, he thought of 9-11. But now when I'm doing Zooms uh, with kids, they think that that picture is directly associated with the pandemic, which is just so fascinating to watch our books become something new because something new is happening around the books. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really interesting and you learn so much as a writer. Sure. And I think that speaks to, again, a big thing that, you know, we've learned in the pandemic is that we can hold multiple things at once and we can be multiple things at once. Um, you know, so the, you mentioned, you know, parents, like you can also be parents and teachers and workers all in the same space. <laughs> yep. um, so it's like we learn that we can be multiple things. And I think that goes along with identity politics, too. It's like we can be multiple things. I can be an American. I can be Asian American. I can be Chinese American. I can be a woman. Like we hold all these intersectional intersectionalities in one place. Um, and that is, I would say for my response to this question is like, that's what I, I, I've kind of, how COVID has affected me in terms of, um, you know, identity politics, because one of, I was inspired to do a lot of work in, um, you know, we were suffering from two pandemics, right? Um, racial justice and COVID. And um, next year, I'm proud to announce that I'll be having several books out. I've got a picture book out um, put with Sleeping Bear, from Asian American history from A to Z. And then I also have four books about racial justice in America um, that address model minority, yellow peril, um, 
for a foreigner, forever foreigner, um, and Asian Black solidarity. So it's like, you know, these are these are important topics that have always been important, <laughs> but have just been amplified, um, especially in the wake of anti-Asian hate that had happened um, along with COVID. So I think those are, you know, it's really, um, I think we, you know, we're also in this cultural reckoning period as well. And we see, and I'm, I'm glad to see so many books addressing um, those topics and teachers talking about them in the classroom. Um, and we're moving away. I think once upon a time, these topics used to be taboo. Um, and I think we're moving away from that. These topics, are, our kids are experiencing these things. Um, you know, it's not, we're no longer sheltering them from tough stuff. Um, you know, that guy, and I think that that's where books are really important. The things that we do are really important because that books are a way um, for students, uh, readers to process tough things. Um, so that, that leads into the second question. You know, what is the role that children's literature plays in socio-emotional learning and how can reading and writing be a tool to process tough things? We'll start with um, Sally. Well, yeah, you know, it made me start thinking, I, I just had this thought the other day about um, Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop's wonderful analogy about windows, mirrors, and doors. Um, you know, we, we need fiction where we can see ourselves. Everyone deserves to be seen in, in a story. Um, and it, it's beautiful and it's absolutely true. Um, so, so there's that, but I was also thinking that, you know, there are mirror, mirrors and there are also models. Uh, when I was a kid, I never saw, you know, another autistic kid or a kid that struggled in school the way I did um, portrayed in a book. But I read voraciously looking for models, looking for models of how other people handled it and what their lives were like and, you know, how that worked out for them to see if I could model myself on that. Um, so, and I think it really speaks to your point, Virginia, where we need to read d diversely. Everyone needs to read diversely. It's super important to see ourselves in books, but we should be seeing lots of different people in books too. Um, we all should. And um, I think that's what grows our hearts, uh, you know, as people. And this has been a really hard year for kids and, you know, teachers and, you know, educational systems are, ups, are worried about kids slipping in their skills and all, but you, you know, I, I think maybe it's time to, to learn some social emotional learning, you know, maybe let kids heal, let kids grow, let them get in touch what it's like to be human and to relate to each other and to deal with the world and to develop their emotional resilience skills because aren't emotional resilience skills probably the most important ones that kids need to learn this year? I kind of think that, so. Can yeah. I jump in there? Because I love what you just said about models. And I think that's so important. I love your, your entire answer. And, and you mentioned like diversities, bringing diverse stories into our classrooms. And I think traditionally we always think of that as race, right? Like diversity in terms of race, but there are so many different kinds of diversities, right? Yeah. They're unspoken, they're hard to, to, to see, but those are just as valuable as the easy ones, the, the diverse picture. I think we're starting to do better with, with the racial diversity, but we have a long way to go with so many other inclusivities. Um, and I just wanted to say, I think writing children's books can be a form of activism. And I don't mean in a way of writing a message. I'm I'm allergic to this idea of coming into a book with a message, but you do come in with a point of view. And, and like Virginia, you're talking about the books you're bringing in. This is your passion. These are the stories you want to tell. That's your point of view. But if you come in with a message, the kids can smell a rat, right? So the true work is when the book is in the hands of the parent, the teacher, or the student, him or herself, and they sort of find meaning within that. So Sally was looking for a model. Maybe a teacher is using Sally's book as a model for how to write a great sentence. There are so many versions of that, but I think at the end of the day, books are vehicles to conversation. And, and if we understand that, then we allow the books to be more powerful. Yes, and I think that's great. There are several things that both of y'all have said that really you know, resonate with me. First of all, Sally, I love this notion of grows your heart. I think we need to put that in the t-shirt. Books grow your heart. 
<laughs> I love that concept. And then this idea of, you know, diverse, diversity is diverse, right? And the importance of um, avoiding a single story. It's like we need to read multiple stories. And then also like, you know, and I liked, you know, Matt, you brought it up too, you know, when we talk about racial and ethnic um, cultures, et cetera. I mean, today's youth, today's generation is multi-ethnic. Um, you know, so we need to capture that. It's no longer this one, you know, we're not talking about Chinese American stories anymore, right? I mean, it's like Chinese American, Irish, <laughs> um, yeah. African American. I mean, it's like we're, we're multi, uh, multi um, um, identities now. And then, you know, just this idea of books as activism. I mean, we look at, look back at our history and not, I'm not talking about like our history, American history. I'm talking about world history from the beginning of time. It's like what always gets banned, right? Books, burning, learning. You know, these are the things that, um, you know, uh, that in order to squash democracy and free thought, and whatever, books are what goes. So it's like books are activism, reading, writing, um, and, you know, teachers have the power to include and exclude books in their curriculum, and that is activism. So what you choose to include and not include is activism, is political. So it's, it's, that's powerful. Um, Chris, what would you like to add to this? I would question? just add, I mean, I love what's being said, so I'm listening so intently, <laughs> taking notes, but what I'm noticing, like, with my own kids and even in my, um, and especially thinking of my college students, too, that kids generally are really brave. They're braver than we give them credit for and they can handle seeing things that maybe are tough and challenging and that provide a moment to be an activist and they wanna be inspired. And I think sometimes like I've met college students who in fact, in my summer class, um, the reading, the, the love of reading kind of got a little bit ruined because it was all message driven. Matt was talking about being allergic to this message concept. and. You know, they want, we got to remember the joy of reading, like when you were a kid, like children's literature is all about the enjoyment and the connection. And it brings parents, teachers, kids together around characters and stories. And I think that's such a powerful, powerful thing. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, for me, when I'm thinking about writing, when I'm thinking about just this topic overall, I think kids are brave and they can handle it. And this is such a great time for these stories to be out there. Yeah, and I mean, I'm gonna argue that kids are braver than us. Yeah, you know, they really they are like think about. I, I just think about like let's link think back to our younger selves. I feel like I was able to do a lot more <laughs> when I was younger because I was braver. You know, like something happens when we get to adulthood. But yes, I think we need to give them credit for being able to take on and tackle tough things and to be able to hold multiple things. Um, and you know, they 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 can do it. Min, what about you? What do you have to add to this conversation? Um, yeah, no, it's interesting hearing everyone talk about like the, the difference between like lessons and, and messages in, in books. I, I was actually puzzled out a new story this weekend for a manuscript and I was falling into that trap of like, I was starting at the, the lesson and backing my way into a story and I, I knew that I was making a mistake. Um, and I was trying to puzzle it out and I was like, there's a big difference between a story that goes in being like, I'm going to teach you a lesson versus a story that reveals something true that allows a reader to like take away something that they then use for their, like Matt was saying, to create your own meaning, to like, to move through the world in a different way because you see things differently. Um, I think there's a, it's a fine line between the two, but I think that's, that's where I was, where I was trying to, to crack that, um, that puzzle of like where I wanted to put a story because I knew that I messed it. I was coming at it the wrong way, and then kids are gonna gonna see that coming a mile away, and then probably run. <laughs> but when we talk about like the role that books play in all this, and like social emotional health, um, I and mean, we've also like books give kids like a space to play with different emotions and kind of like try on different scenarios, and then kind of. Um, take it from there and one thing I was I was lucky enough to do an event with Matt for the launch of Milo Imagines the World um one thing I love about that book is like the imagination is how kids engage with the world right that's like their how they're framing the world and as you're like so I was saying your heart grows as you're reading but also your scope of understanding and the way that you see the world can grow through reading so I think the more that 
kids are engaging with these different ideas and creative concepts or emotional things on the page, um, that's something that they take with them once they close the book and, and move out and walk out the door. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we have a question here from one of the audience members and please, you know, write top up your questions. We want to be able to um, be as interactive as possible. So please send us your questions. So this question is, has your writing process changed during these last few years because of the pandemic? What has this looked like and what tips might you have for new writers just starting during these times? Um, and I'll go ahead and start and give a response to that and say, like, I think it's, you know, the same as any type of write. Give yourself a deadline and give yourself time. Um, you know, you make it happen by just making it happen. So sit and write and find time. We have, I, and I think even like us seasoned writers, um, we all come, I'm sure I'm not the only one, please tell me, but I, we all come up with reasons not to write, right? <laughs> <laughs> our house needs to be cleaned or this I mean there's like so many different reasons why we don't write but we, you really need to make yourself have time for me my strategy is I make appointments with myself um because that's how I got my dissertation done and whatever I won't I will break up I will break take away my time all the time I don't guard my time very well but what I do do well is that if I make an appointment with someone I'm there um, so what I had to do was on my calendar, I literally block out time and made an appointment with me and then that I did it. Um, so that's kind of how I get stuff done. Um, what about you, Matt? How do, what's your, what's your, um, strategy? So I kind of do something similar. I try to hold myself accountable. Um, and, but I've also kind of like calmed down and not trying not to beat myself up if I don't produce as much as I want to produce. So I'm trying to like find that, that balance. Um, but I'm also, this is a, my best advice for people who are starting to write. I'm so inspired by other people's books. Like I can't, I can't even tell you how blown away I am by some of the stuff I've been reading to my kids, to students. Like I just, I get so excited. Um, we actually charted Lyft the other day man just so you know oh, we wow. we tried to make sure that dan santat in the illustrations like there was a planted seed for all the imaginative moments you know for each one and i i couldn't find the last one and my daughter found it so like i just get so inspired by that this is the psychology of a child um i recently did a an event with chris and we we talked about his new book and it was just so fun to hear him talk about where it came from, where the story came from. I do, do you mind if I go back for one second and, and pose a question to you all? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the bravery it takes as young people uh, when you're a reader. I have this theory and I wanna know how you all fall in on this. I feel like adults today read to reinforce what they already believe. Like they read to say, oh yeah, that's what I think too. And I don't think kids know what they think yet. So they're more open to reading everything. I have been trying to be open like that as a reader. Again, I'm trying to read everything from all across the political spectrum. And it is so much better. I'm curious, do you all find that with young readers that they're still trying to figure out their ideology? And that's like the magic of it. That's a, that's a great observation. I, I, I know that I have to fight that instinct just like scrolling through Twitter. It's like you see something that rankles you and like it's so easy to just like keep scrolling and like until you find something that does um, reinforce <laughs> your preconceived notion or what you're already thinking. So I think you're right. Like it's easy to use literature and use reading to like further entrench yourself within yeah. your, your learning. But to, to be open to to all these things is is difficult. I think you're right. Kids are kids haven't necessarily put themselves in that track and like close, close things off yet. So that's a, a really interesting way to look at it. I, I, I have to say it's such a good, sorry, it just it reminds what? me the other no, day no. I was with my daughter and I asked her what we were talking about books and getting ready for school. And I said, no matter what, just be yourself, right? Which is such a solid parenting thing. And as a writer, that's kind of what we're always writing. But she sort of was like, what does that mean? Yeah. And I, it hit me really hard. It's really to your point, Matt. Like, it's not that that's wrong. It's just, she doesn't know what that is yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think it's important that I put myself squarely in the unknown of that. Mm -hmm. 
you know that's cool i like that i like that idea that she's how could she answer that how could she know which direction to travel and man you made me think about it when you talk about tweeting and stuff and i think like right now oh, we're in twitter. this content. are we yeah. doing twitter <laughs> <laughs> i think we're in this period of short text you know, I mean, like, we're not, in a, you know, to your point, Matt, and I, okay, I'm going to get to what I mean by that. But, you know, Matt, to your point, I think as adults, like reading adult books, right? It's like, it's a commitment. You're, you're taking it, it looks big. <laughs> it's a commitment. So you really kind of select, like you choose, like, okay, I'm going to read this one, not read this one. Da, da, da. But with short text, you're more likely to read anything because it's not that much of a time commitment, right? So the tweet, the twits, the, ins, uh, it's not twits, tweets, <laughs> no, twits. Instagram, <laughs> Instagram, like whatever. These are quick, quick, you could take them in, blah, blah, blah. And I think the same thing with, um, you know, um, um, children's books, right? Like we should be encouraging adults, not just kids to read children's books because they're not that big of a commitment, they're short. And they'll open your mind. And I think part of, you know, for example, like that's the power of book clubs too, right? Book clubs and whatnot, because we're, so I'm in several book clubs and um, I don't like all the choices that everyone makes. But the thing is, the power of that is that I'm forced to read it to be in book club. So it's like, I'm, you know, like we have to kind of read things that we wouldn't know. Otherwise we pick, I'm going to always pick the type of books I pick, but without mm -hmm. somebody else telling me you need to do this, right? So I think that's the power of book clubs, that's the power of teachers putting books into the hands of children, but it's also the power of short text and children's books. So I want, I you you may, yeah, that really triggered something in me because I was like, I feel like we need to get away from this notion that children's books are just for children. Yeah, absolutely. For adults too, read them. Yeah. And it's not that much of a commitment. We can sit, so read a bunch of them at the same time. Sally, you, why don't you wrap up this question? What um, and so it's, we're we're playing off Matt's question now um, about bravery and reading. What are your what are what are some of your thoughts? Yeah, and and this that sense of wonder that kids have, and that's absolutely true. And I think everything you were saying, Virginia, points to the need too for classroom libraries that have a wide assortment of different things that you know the cornucopia of beautiful books that kids can. Can, can reach to. And you know, I, I have a very old librarian friend who's all every year um, at the holidays, she gives every one of her adult children uh, children's books. And she has done that since they were very young and they're all in their thirties now. And she's still giving her kids children's books every year at Christmas because they're the most poignant, wonderful, encapsulated heart emotion of what it means to be human sometimes. I mean, they're, they're works of art. They're beautiful. And it's such a shame if adults don't get a chance and opportunity to read them and treasure them as well. You know, and I, I think it's the same with middle grade, with young adult. You know, we think that these are these slotted pigeonholed classifications, but they're not really. These are books for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. dip into a middle grade book and see what it's like. Remember what it's like to be coming of age. That's what that's about. And I think we're all coming of age all our lives in various different ways. And it's something we can all relate to. So uh, there's wonderful arguments for everyone being open to reading everything. Um, even as a closed-minded adults in our little silos, because we huh. every anything we can do to bust out of the silos that we're in, you know, and and reach out and see how each other we're all thinking. Yeah. Um, that's what we need to do, and books do that. And there was this really great quote I read the other day, where a reader a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, yeah. which is because it allows us to see, and, and that's what grows the empathy really, it, you know, if you, being able to read and slip inside the, the skin of all, as many different types of people, then, then you start to learn something about humanity. And that's what we, that's, I think the name of the game. Yeah. And you, I mean, research shows that over and over again, that what books do, especially for young readers is build empathy. Um, so if we're talking about building a more healthy, socio emotional, kind world, um, books are the tools. Um, just to finish up with the, the question that has been posed by an audience member, um, has any, does anyone else want to share your writing process? How has your writing process oh. changed during these past few years because of the pandemic? And um, what has this looked like? And what tips might you have for new writers um, just starting out? So uh, Chris, do you want to answer this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with, with, 
what's been said. And I, I would add this little maybe, I had to kind of move writing to my spiritual center because it's easy not to value it. And so thinking of it as a, a true value for, for yourself, for your family, and then sharing that value with your kids who you're also now maybe helping to be their teacher and doing things, roles that you haven't had before, kind of like Matt was talking about, like being able to address that and say like writing is part of who I am is a good first step. And then of course, making appointments with yourself, finding the times that work for you and giving yourself a lot of grace to, you know, that if you don't write every day, it's not the end, but you do have to do the work and kind of trying to reconcile that. And that's something for me that I've had to do is every process for every book, including these next books I'm writing, it's just seemingly different. I thought I had it down. It was nighttime and everyone's in bed, but now the kids are staying up later. They have weightier issues. I'm way more tired. Maybe yeah. I'm getting older or whatever. And now I want to go to sleep. So maybe it's the morning, yeah. you know? So it, it's different every time, but the value has to be there. Sure. And I think it's also this notion of like, give your, like you just said, give yourself grace. It's like, you don't have to, you, nobody writes a perfect first draft. Nobody does, right? Like, <laughs> does any of us write a perfect first draft? It's like, they're all crappy. And then you work them through and then they get better. So don't, you know, you don't have to get it right the first time. Um, I'm gonna, this is a similar question and I'm gonna toss it to Min. Um, so what has, how, how can we encourage students to use writing as a tool for self-care? Um, so in general, you know, we talked about how is reading and writing self-care, um, but what, what are some ways that you have used writing as a tool for self-care? Um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because as a kid, I was like super, super shy. I was like that kid who would like never speak up in school, never speak up in class or anything like that. But um, so I was always reading and I, I kind of looked at books as my um, like escape from the world, right? And use books to the way, I, so what was interesting is like, so books as a reader, as a kid was my escape from the world. And now as a writer, books have ironically become my way back into the world because they're how I connect with people now, right? So it's like, um, I, I think the the things that that I used, I, I guess another way of putting it is like as a kid, I used books, as a reader, I used books to connect with myself. And now as a writer, I use books to connect with other people. Um, and I think a lot of that for kids when they're writing, it's like using that space to to be mindful about the issues around you and like be mindful of what other people may be going through. Um, and I think it's a, it's just a helpful exercise for everyone to, to be introspective as a, as a way of like going inward as a, as a pathway to going outward, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, that's great. I love that. Um, Matt, would you like to add? Yeah, I think, um, this is like, if I could offer one piece of advice for teachers, obviously we know nothing about teaching, but. I'll throw this I out there. <gasps> oh yeah, you do. And so does Chris. And so do I. <laughs> but I think like sometimes we teach kids how to write for school instead of how to how to write for real. And um, I, I think allowing the freedom in class, there is no right answer. You know, it, it's just follow your fire. Um, and you know, earlier we were talking about bringing books into the class and being an activist. I think the act of bringing the book in the class, reading it to the class is the activism. I think then you have to show humility and say that there is no right. And I'm not gonna offer you the right answer about what this book is about. Now you, you have the story, what are you gonna do with it? There's this one teacher who told me that every year she reads Mexican White Boy to her high school in somewhere in Arizona. And she said, every year I do the same thing. She was a, a white, teacher in a predominantly Mexican American community and she's reading it out loud and she said inevitably I come to a word it's slang Spanish I don't know what it means now I know what it means though because I've done this like seven years but I still pose the question who out though there knows what this word means and then she reads the phrase or word and she said it always allows somebody in the back who might not be engaged to lean forward give her the answer and that humility makes this boy, he's, he has the answers, not the teacher. So this book is his book, not the academic's book. So I think that's a powerful teaching move is showing like massive humility. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. 
Chris and Sally, before we move on to the next question, do you want to add to this um, question about um, encouraging students to use writing as a tool for self-care? Yeah, I think, you know, sort of thinking on what Matt said too about writing and not getting too hooked up on what the right answer is or the right way to do it. I think um, journaling is such an amazing self-care tool, but kids are often afraid, like they'll get a really beautiful journal and it just looks too perfect or, or they're so trained in their mind to be writing towards somebody, what somebody else wants to hear and to feed what, to feed the other person what they want to hear, the teacher for a grade. So sometimes I just like, I tell them, I show them some of my journals, which is like completely wrecked up things that I just buy at the dolly store. And some, I think this was a Linda Berry trip. Do you know Linda Berry, that wonderful, wonderful art education here. And she said, you know, just take the page and like put a big X right through it. Just wreck it up like this. And then the page is already wrecked. You don't have to worry about it. You can just write whatever you want on it. And you're not like, you know, ruining anything or whatever. Just go for it. Just, just get out what you want to say, because what you want to say matters so much. It matters more than anything. And you deserve to have your thoughts expressed. Yeah, I love I, that. I, I love the heart of that. I just, that's okay. so true. And I, the only thing I would add too is just that um, kids are kind of quiet. And it, they need space and time to process and think. And I think giving them that chance to talk. And I, I've been blown away by like school visits where I'll have kids write a poem in response to something going on. And, you know, this quiet kid all of a sudden has amazing things to say in different ways that are just so unexpected. So I think as a tool, it's just providing space to not answer a question about the book, but let the book provoke whatever's inside of you to come out. Yeah. yeah. Virginia, there's a, there's a hand raised on one of the attendees. I don't know if we're able to, to let them speak. So I've got, yeah, uh, if Gary, I see Gary Garrett, Gary Gray. I, I feel see like Gary we might know him. Yes, Gary. If, if you could write it in the Q&A, because I actually do have two questions that people have already posted. So let's, um, Gary, please just write your answer in the uh, question in the Q&A and it will get to you. Um, so we have about 12 minutes left and we've got a couple questions here. So I'm going to pose them um, in the order received. How has the need to interact as an author on social media affected you both positively and negatively? Um, so does anyone want to answer this? I feel like Min, you have an amazing pinned tweet about that, don't you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to describe a gif or a, a gif, but it's not just about Twitter and it's like a lot of ways it feels like, uh, um, a necessary evil. It's like, it's something that I feel afraid to give up, but it feels like you're on there and it's also like, necessary it feels like you're taking a small dose dose of poison every time you do it <laughs> right? like, there's so much negative negativity out there and it's like they're the obligation to, to be on comes with a call um and i think for me i think it's valuable because i like knowing the conversation being part of knowing what what is out there but i do recognize that um that it's not a free of charge right and i'd have to make a point to put the phone away to to make sure that, especially during a pandemic and my kids are around all the time, I'm like, I don't wanna be, you know, lost in my phone during all that. So making a conscious choice of like, when I go on and all of that and not letting the the pull of social media dictate everything else. Um, and use it, use it for what it's intended for and what benefits you and what feeds you, um, but know where to draw that line for sure. And I don't always do a good job of that, but I, but I do try. <laughs> I think, I mean, first of all, it's a full-time job. I mean, like you look at organizations that have social media managers, the job, right? Yeah. So it's like you, this, it's a lot of work. Um, and I would say I go in and out. Like sometimes I'm active, sometimes I'm not. And then I'm also like right now I'm more active for my center than I am for myself. And, you know, so it's like, it, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but I would say for authors, we kind of need it, right? We need a social media presence. We need an online presence. Um, but then also I feel like, I don't know about y'all, but I'm always definitely scared of becoming a meme or <laughs> like, <laughs> or something, you know? So it's like, you also have that fear, but I, I do think men's rights, like we have to recognize we live in this world and the kids are living in this world. And I think one of the things being on a college campus that I've discovered is we, you know, came of the age where we made mistakes. We made many mistakes, but it wasn't recorded. 
you know, like the mistakes that our kids are making now is documented on social media, you know, so it's, we live in this world that we have to navigate and manage that. Um, and as authors, again, yes, and I think men, we got to play, there's, there's good and bad, and we just kind of have to, you know, negotiate that. And just again, in the interest of time for nine minutes, I'm going to um, move on to another question, unless Chris, Sally, and Matt, unless one of you are burning to answer the social media question. I'll just say, I think we need it less than we believe we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think we need it. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so um, so as an author, I'm wondering about the newer normal as it relates to getting published. Did you see in any changes in how that works? So what's the new normal coming out of, um, I mean, I think, you know, we had this with the pandemic, book, book publishers were worried about, right? About books and the industry and um, whatnot and, and what was, and I think we can see trends in terms of like, there's definitely, which I love, there's definitely more um, uh, more push for BIPOC voices and perspectives and um, authors, you know, own voices, authors, et cetera, there's that. Um, but we also know that book publishers can only publish so many books per year. Um, and so the, the market gets, gets more competitive. Um, what are your all's response to that, to that? Does someone, Sally, do you have a response to that? What are you, what do you think, um, do, what changes and trends you see in this new, you yeah. know, pandemic publishing world? Well, I, there are different angles from which to look at the question, I guess, in terms of um, more people are reading than ever. I think book sales are, are way up. This is all wonderful. Um, on, on the other side, there's supply chain issues where just obtaining paper <laughs> is a little tricky and, and that's delayed a lot of people's publishing uh, dates. Uh, I know a lot of authors who've had their dates, their, their pub dates pushed, uh, you know, a few weeks or a few months. So uh, it's always been a tricky, tenuous, weird thing. And I think it continues to be maybe for just changing reasons. I, yeah. Yeah. Probably. I've become a huge fan, a fan of yours over the course of this hour. What's the one book we should all read from you? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, oh. I can answer that. Someday birds. Okay. I love What's Sunday, someday, someday, someday birds. Someday birds. Yes. Oh my gosh. Is that have a blue cover? Yep. Ah, okay, okay. Someday birds. Oh, There's a little thanks. product placement from the girl that quit the Girl Scouts so she wouldn't yeah. sell the cookies. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I cried. I cried, Sally. It made me cry. It was beautiful. Um, I would just offer a quick answer and just say, it's kind of amazing to watch publishing rethink their model because it's such an antiquated system and you know now like not everybody has to work in the office people are moving to different states it's kind of ridiculous that book publishing is in the most expensive state you know city in in the country so it's kind of cool to watch that and now we're going to get more diversity within the industry which i think is like a huge deal um not just racial but just like geographic diversity yeah. um, so that's a cool thing to see um i think unfortunately some people had to release a debut book over the pandemic and I can't even imagine. I feel awful for, and I feel like we have to support debut authors because it's a tough time to come out with a new book. Um, but I think it's cool to see books thriving, you know? And I think other industries are looking to the book industry for content and that's cool to see too. So we're doing okay, but you know, it's just changing. Yeah, and I, think, that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Min. Oh, no, I was going to a quick point. Like, I feel like one thing that it, while the mechanics of publishing kind of have to shift and are changing a bit, one thing I feel the pandemic revealed to everyone is just the need and thirst for, like, for art, right? And, like, people, like, gravitate towards art to, to find, like, solace or escape or, like, kind of inspiration during these times. So I think publishing, while... The pathway to get there might be different. They're always going to be looking for new stories, and I think that's something to take a little bit of um, uh, as a silver lining to all this. And I think yes, there's always trends, right? We know that there's always trends that the publishing book industry does, and this and that. But I think there's always room for good books. So, um, you know, for those of you that are writing stories, keep writing stories. Keep and you know, keep pitching them and keep 
even like um i'll say like proposed lucky chinese new year um this got rejected like two three times <laughs> before it landed you know so i mean I've, it's it's you just keep keep at it keep at it um okay so i know that we have about four more minutes and i'm gonna um part a part b this last question from the audience members um so and it's a fun question we're gonna we're gonna end on happiness um if we can have each of us share um the audience members have asked what do we do for self joy and what is our favorite children's book that we remember oh. reading so i think that's a fun a fun thing to to kind of um um you know end with so um i'll go ahead and start to give you all some time to think um so anna green gables i that's pure i loved i like want to be Anne shirley i you know i that's i i have a little redheaded orphan in me <laughs> um, so Anne of Green Gables is my favorite children's book and what I do for self joy. Um, I love pay, playing the piano, even though I play very badly and um, watching TV in my bed. Those are probably the things that give me self joy. Um, Chris, what gives you self joy? What's your favorite book? Children's book? Um, it's changing all the time, but I really like martial arts. Krav Maga is martial art I love. That gives me a lot of joy in gardening, of course, and hanging out with the kids. The book that popped in my brain Lord of the Rings always wants to be there, but I keep pushing it away because I want to say Bridge of Terabithia was the one that marked the time for me because it showed me that a boy and a girl can be friends. Like it's not focused on that and it opened my emotions up. So I always think of that book. What? Boys and girls can be friends? <laughs> <laughs> First time was allowed. <laughs> Men, what about you? Joy, self joy oh. and favorite book. Yeah, no. First, I have to give a shout out to my man Gary for asking that self joy question. He's yeah. a, he's a great guy. He has an amazing book coming out. Um, I'm not sure when, but it's on its way. Um, but I I moved to San Diego just before the pandemic started, so I have been slowly picking up surfing. It, I'm terrible at it, but it's one of those things where I'm like, I can go out there and be absolutely horrible and still have a wonderful time and have a great workout. So I just love being out on the water whenever I can um, or under the water as, as the case may be. <laughs> um, and as far as a book, one of the picture books that left a big mark on me was um, A Chair for My Mother by Vera B. Oh. Williams. Um, to me, that one almost like created a template for like familial love and community and all that. And I, I find myself kind of like thinking back to the the feelings and emotions I had reading that book as a kid and revisiting it and it's that that to me is like a, a masterpiece. Oh great. What about you Matt? Self-joy and favorite book? Self-joy, my compost that I've started. <laughs> uh, I started a year ago. Just a wonderful looking soil now. Um, so I feel good about that. Um, I like making iced coffee, uh, cold brew. Okay so books. I'm going to actually talk about books that I read with my kids because I'm rediscovering the wonders of children's literature through my kids. I love this book named Drawn Together. Uh, Min wrote it. I think it actually describes what so many young people in America are going through now, where you can't completely communicate with a grandparent because of a cultural removal. So uh, Jean Yang talks about that a lot. Um, uh, you know, we've had many conversations about that, about how culture is a changing thing. Uh, so I love what Min did in that book. Um, I love All of Me, Chris Barron. Uh, it's his first book. I say, follow the fire. And I think he followed the fire there. That's such a passionate, powerful book. Something that didn't exist in the market before. And then um, my favorite all-time picture book, is called Each Kindness by Jackie Woodson. And mm. I, I think that book is tremendous. Great. So Sally, last but not least, <laughs> self joy and favorite children's book. Oh gosh, I this favorite children's book is super hard. It's impossible to say, I just, but I recently have read Drawn Together, which really resonated with us because my children had a tough time understanding their French grandparents that speak, speak no English. So that's always been a thing until their French got to the point um, where they could talk. We had the same issues. And Milo Imagines the World is absolutely lovely. I just, oh, one of those books where your heart just feels warm after you read it. 
Um, also, when I was a kid, this is a, such a silly bu book, but when I was a kid, I loved it because it was choral reading. I mean, we all read it together. It was a group of about uh, you know, five or 10 kids and we would stay in for recess and we would all read Go Dog Go at the same time and switch the pages and read it at the same time. And doing that together with other kids was super, super fun. So that was a big joy. I think that's what sparked my joy in reading um, in like kindergarten, first grade. Um, beyond that, it's like, yeah, I love the beach too. I love sitting and watching my husband surf because I cannot, but I love just getting on the board and like hanging out um, and just being at the beach. And I love playing the piano and the guitar and I play with Virginia and we have our little group. So that's really mm -hmm. cool. We yeah, have our yeah, recital yeah. group. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, so thank you all. Thank you so much. Big hugs oh. and big claps. Um, thank you so much for being here. And then also thank you so much to the um, attendees that gave up your Thursday afternoon to be here with us. So make sure that you do what Sonia says. So click, 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 click. <laughs> Buy lots of things. Um, and yeah, and twit about us. Can I, can I say one thing, Virginia? I think Chris brought up a good point when we were all talking that some of us would be willing to visit a class, right? So I think it's a good idea to, to bring somebody in, um, especially in San Diego. I think we're trying to like do this for San Diego. So yeah, just throwing that out there. Definitely, yeah. Websites and all that stuff, we're, we're here, we're a community. Yeah, and you can also contact us at Warwick's and we will help facilitate that for you. So we'd be happy to be a part of that. Oh, you guys, this was just awesome and I want it to keep going and going. Ah. And I want you all to come over on my porch and keep talking about your favorite books because that we didn't get to spend enough time on that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing those stories and all those wonderful um, thoughts and ideas. And wonder if you could uh, remember to click, 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 as we said, and we will try to contact people about the recording. Um, it'll go somewhere. So we will have a recording of this available either through our YouTube, but we'll, we'll, we're, we're still determining that. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you for the next event. Thank you, Thank you all so, so much for having us. Bye, y'all.